Hi, everybody, and welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health System. And today, uh, on our latest Community Conversation, we are going to be talking about improving black maternal health. And to do so, I have two experts here to join me today, and I'm thrilled to have you both here. Let me introduce these ladies from left to right on my side, right to left on your screen. Closest to me is Dr. Nkachinare Amadi. She is an OBGYN here at Atlantic Health System, part of Atlantic Medical Group as well. Uh, and next to her, we have Dr. Ophelia Byers, who is the Chief Nursing Officer for Overlook Medical Center, part of Atlantic Health System. Good to see you both. Thank nice you. to be here. All right, so we have um, plenty of time for this important conversation. Before we do so, though, I want to give everybody at home a little just quick run a show as to how this is going to work. Um, as you can imagine, you are seeing us on Facebook, but if for whatever reason the feed should drop out or maybe you got to run away for a second, um, this whole show will live on our YouTube channel and on our website, AtlanticHealth.org. So you can go there and check out not only this community conversation, but all of them. And while the doctors and I will be talking through this, you are invited to participate as well. In the chat section there below, you can enter in any questions or comments you may have. Uh, want a little clarity about something we talked about? Go ahead and ask it. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. If we can't get to all of them, uh, we'll certainly try to get you an answer after the show. We'll have our experts take a look at those questions and get back to you. So that's how this works. Why don't we jump right in? All righty. Okay, uh, improving black maternal health. Uh, and for those folks who saw our marketing materials, they'll understand a little bit about the context as to why we're doing this. But for the benefit of those who didn't get a chance to see it, uh, whoever wants to start first, why are we tackling this subject head on in such a visible way on something like a Facebook Live conversation? What, what, what do we need to improve about black maternal health in this country? And whoever wants to go first. Well, I can just uh, briefly say um, we know that um, there is a disparity in the types of um, health outcomes that black moms are having. Um, all across the country, but in particular, we're looking at New Jersey, obviously, mm -hmm. as yep. people who live here. And we know that um, black moms are seven times more likely um, to have a pregnancy-related complication. Seven times. Seven times. Actually, it's some places like seven and a half, but wow. seven times more likely to have um, a pregnancy-related um, complication that usually lives or sorry, I mean, uh, leads to mm -hmm. um, uh, a negative outcome. So um, that's a very high statistic, and it's something that New Jersey has taken head on mm -hmm. um, with um, a Nurture New Jersey initiative um, that the First Lady- um, Tammy Murphy, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, uh, started, and so uh, now that this disparity that we've kind of known um, in the background has been brought to the forefront, mm -hmm. um, we want to be proactive in addressing it. This is also a ceremonial week, is it not, Dr. Absolutely. Byers? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it is um, a national observance of Black Maternal um, Health Week. And um, it is also National Minority Health Month. And so this week runs from April 11th to April 17th. Um, and it is a celebration of black moms, but also awareness um, about the disparities. <coughs> Dr. Amadi said, um, pregnancy-related deaths are um, any deaths that occur within one year of the end of a pregnancy. So it's not just during labor or anything exactly. along those lines. It's, it's, it's also includes the postpartum period. And again, the whole year after, moms are at risk. Um, and so it's really important to understand that for all women. Um, we know that uh, the United States um, is, um, of, the, of the 11 developed countries that it's been compared to, um, it is the worst performing in maternal mortality. And so about 700 women um, out of per 100,000 births um, each year uh, die um, related to pregnancy complications. And of those 700 men, women, um, two thirds um, are black women. So it's incredibly important that we have this conversation. As Dr. Ramadi said, New Jersey is one of the um, lower performing states in the country. Yes. Um, it is fourth um, in maternal mortality um, in the country. Um, and again, that's where the higher numbers are worse, right? That's, that's where right. the higher numbers are worse. Right. So fourth in the country. Um, and, you know, it, the, again, two thirds of black women are affected. So incredibly important that we focus on this. Um, it is a huge disparity and we need to close that gap. So I would think that most folks um, presume that, and certainly we are a health system that is based in New Jersey, so uh, perhaps I'm a little biased, but I think most people would have thought that healthcare in New Jersey would that this statistic would be a major outlier. That for the most part, healthcare in New Jersey, we are in a state that has a lot of 
healthcare opportunities for folks, um, a lot of universities, a lot of um, opportunity for people to receive the care they need. And yet this statistic continues to be a major problem here in New Jersey. Um, Historically speaking, is this something we're recognizing more recently? As this, you know, it sort of seems like um, perhaps we're only now starting to get our, our arms around the serious problem this presents here in New Jersey. Or is this something that we've kind of known for a long time, do you think? Or are we sort of now waking up to the seriousness of this problem? What do you think? You think we're kind of... I would say black women knew. Yeah. yeah. Black women knew. Yeah. Um, as we say, listen to black women. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, our, our black healthcare professionals, our physicians, our nurses, nurse midwives, our scholars, um, we've known um, for decades um, that there's been a, a health disparity overall. Um, and certainly um, when it comes to obstetrical care, um, it is great to see that people are listening more, right. that um, you know, our, our political leaders are listening, um, you know, the, the healthcare community is listening more, but we've lost a lot of women and babies um, in the process, so um, we have known. It's, yes. it's due, long overdue. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So let's tuck into what we think are some of the root causes behind these issues. Um, uh, I guess, Dr. Amadi, if you would start, what are some of the things, in, in, and whether it makes sense to start first with some of the specific issues women are experiencing, or do we want to start with some of the root causes, whichever order you think is most productive, but, but what is behind this, really? Well, I don't think you can um, address one without the other. Um, so some of the root causes are, you know, we use this euphemistic statement, but access to care, mm -hmm. um, but that is important. You know, being able to uh, start prenatal care early, um, uh, being able to get even an ultrasound, right, to determine how far along you are in your pregnancy so that you can start that prenatal care mm -hmm. early. Um, so, um, you know, that plays a role. Obviously, you know, um, there are other social determinants of health um, that we can go into, um, but we can't ignore the fact that, you know, poverty, um, lack of, um, you know, accessible health care, um, and providers, right? You know, so what is um, accessible health care? It's having a provider in your community that you can go see in a timely fashion. You know, if it takes you uh, two months to get in to see a doctor, right, and you're pregnant, that's the problem because you've missed a big portion of the first trimester in, in getting educated, making sure that your weight is appropriate, that you're getting your prenatals, mm -hmm. um, in, or looking at you know, anatomy scans of the fetus. You know, just so much happens in that you know, first trimester um, that you know, if you've missed it just because you couldn't make an appointment, um, it impacts the overall you know, um, quality of your um, pregnancy. It's like building blocks, right? I mean, yeah. those early steps that you miss are the foundation of your pregnancy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the phrase you use, social determinants of health. Um, for those folks in our audience who, who maybe are hearing that term for the first time or aren't familiar with what it means, Dr. Byers, what, what are social determinants of health? Sure, um, it's a number of things that have been um, determined um, by our World Health Organization, WHO. For example, um, it is housing. Um, it is um, access to um, nutritious foods, high quality foods. Um, it is transportation. It's a number of things. Um, you know, they're, they're often, the social determinants of health are often looked at as the root causes. I'll go a step further and, and name those root causes as racism and classism. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly important. One of the reasons we have those disparities in the social determinants of health is because of those isms, if you will, mm -hmm. right, um, that are structural. They're embedded in, in the reality of um, black people's experiences here in this country um, and really are, are what um, is, is really that foundational um, piece to um, the disparities of health. For, for the folks who are, who are seeing this and saying, and perhaps we have a, an expectant mom who's watching this um, and is hearing these things and saying that, that what we're describing is exactly lining up with her experience, her personal experience. Let's start to talk about how that person can help themselves or, or what, what are the things that we can be doing both as a system and in, can, we can be encouraging individuals to do to, to help ensure that this statistic isn't something that becomes all too real for them. Where, where do we encourage people to go? What's the, what's the best first course of action we can encourage people to do? Well, I think it's important that people continue to speak up and be vocal. Um, I think 
um, that, you know, some of the stories that I've heard um, and feedback is that, well, I tried to tell them that this was happening and nobody would listen to me. And, you know, if you listen to uh, stories um, in the community, that's a re recurrent theme that, you know, I did try and I wasn't heard. And I would say that and that's between patient and physician you're talking yes, about. Yes, right, yeah. Right. I would say continue to speak up, continue to ask questions, um, continue to be your own advocate, um, because um, that's, that's the first step in ending this cycle, is bringing awareness to, and only you can bring awareness to what's happening to your body, right? So bringing awareness to what's happening and asking questions. So. You know, oftentimes I think um, as a black woman and uh, uh, black patients, um, we're told that we're aggressive, we're combative, um, and um, the sort simply, of stereotypical yes, perspective, right? Yeah. And t people are simply asking questions, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, um, don't worry about that. Be combative, be aggressive, and get your questions answered. Right. Um, but you know, it's in asking the question well, how come my feet and hands are swelling? What does that mean, mm -hmm. right? I, yesterday my hands and feet weren't swollen, but today they are. Does it mean anything? And if the person that you're interacting with says, no, that doesn't mean anything, but you in your heart of hearts know this can't be right. Something's not right. Something's not right. Then there's always the next person you can ask. Um, and there are always resources online even. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, the CDC has the Hear Her Concerns um, program, um, or campaign I should say, and it gives you questions that you can ask your provider, um, also things to look for that, you know, as we continue to talk, you know, I can highlight, but. Um, and it, we'll put those resources on our website yeah, too. Yeah, so absolutely. So people can look them up as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, let's start with education, for sure. Um, educating yourselves, resources like the CDC. Another great resource that I enjoy is blackmamasmatter.org um, that is very focused on, on black maternal health. Um, knowing that you can ask the questions, knowing that you can interview your um, obstetrician or your certified nurse midwife, um, asking them about what their knowledge is of uh, black the, the, the specifics around black maternal health care and, and the disparities. Um, making sure that your village, if you will, your birth partner, um, your mother, whoever it is that is going to be with you, is also educated along with you so that they can advocate for you if for any reason you can't advocate for yourself, particularly when you're admitted um, to have your baby. Um, thinking about your call list, for example, we usually create call lists um, to announce birth or announce that we are um, in labor. Add the patient advocate or patient relations to that list. That's something you can find the number to that um, um, team on the website of the hospital that you are planning to give birth. Um, have that already in your phone um, so that if for any reason you have issues with um, the care that you're receiving, you know who you can call right away to escalate concerns. The most important thing is to know that you have a right, a right to high quality health care. Um, you have a right to escalate concerns if you have them. And your healthcare team has a responsibility to you to give you the best possible obstetrical care. One of the things we talk about a lot on this show is the, the patient-physician dynamic, right? Having a physician you know and trust and have, and then that physician um, has seen you over the course of several years, knows you and your, and your well-being, your health history. Um, what's your message in, in, for, for folks out there, uh, expectant moms who maybe you know, don't have a relationship yet with, with either a primary care physician or, or an OBGYN, what, how important is that dynamic? Can you just find any old doctor and, and, and work with that person, or is there real value in managing and having that relationship over time? Absolutely, I think, you know, oftentimes we're very busy and if we feel good, then we don't, you know, we don't think uh, to, you know, I should get, you know, a routine basic health care checkup. But I think if you start early to build and foster that relationship, then when you transition into, I want to have a baby, or I'm having other, you know, we're talking about having babies, obviously, but I'm either having other health concerns, then. Throughout your life, sure, all right, kinds of stuff. You, you already have established that relationship. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, it's, and relationships are hard in general. So I think if there is something that you're finding concerning in the initial startup in the relationship, you know, don't be so shy or reluctant to bring it up. You know, well, you know, I want to see you. 
I, I, I looked online, um, you got great reviews, but when I asked you a question, I didn't feel like you answered it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, give people an opportunity to rectify the situation um, so that you can build relationship. Because, you know, let's be honest, there is a, like a, a shortage of, you know, providers as well mm -hmm. that we also need to acknowledge. So, you know, uh, in, in acknowledging that and, and trying to maintain access to healthcare, I think it's important to, you know, try to improve the relationship. But where there is no, you know, opportunity for, you know, rectifying a situation, then, you know, then look to the next person who will hear what you will say. For those folks who may be saying to themselves, okay, great, how do I find a doctor at Atlantic Health System? Uh, if you go to our website, AtlanticHealth.org, you'll see the Find a Doctor link at the top of the page, uh, and that will provide you with all of the physicians here at Atlantic Health System that you can connect with, there we can sort them by geography, you can sort them by languages spoken, all of that stuff to help you find somebody who fits exactly your specialty. So if you're looking for somebody specific, that's a great place to start, uh, AtlanticHealth.org. Question from the audience from Karen. Um, what role, and, and maybe this is tied to the social determinants question we talked about earlier, what role does nutrition play in, um, in the health of, of an of a expectant mom and her unborn child? Whoever, whoever wants to take sure. it. Sure. Um, you know, it, it plays a big role, of course. Um, you know, nutrition during pregnancy is incredibly important. There's another life growing inside that needs additional calories and, and high quality um, nutri nutrients. Um, absolutely, social, social determinants of health is a big part of that. Um, it is the access to high quality food. And not just the access to high quality food, but the affordability of those um, things. Um, but it is also recognizing that there are community organizations that can support that. So it is asking um, your physician, your nurse, um, your nurse midwife, your doula, if you have, please, if you have the ability, add a doula um, to your village of, of people who can support you. Um, but there are programs that can support um, anyone in getting, um, having access to high quality foods and nutrients. Absolutely. But absolutely important. I just wanted to say also, a nutritionist, you know, um, one of the things that we're always um, trying to manage is avoiding um, gestational diabetes in pregnancy. And so um, nutrition obviously plays a big role. And if you're, if you're learning to change your eating habits or you've always have had um, pretty good and well-established eating habits, but you're still finding yourself with rapid weight gain and those type of things, a nutritionist can really help maybe curate a better diet for you. And so, um, you know, knowing what kind of other resources are available, um, I think is part of that educational process. Um, so we've talked a lot about advice for patients and for individuals. Um, question we just got on on Facebook. Um, what's your message to physicians, uh, to, to uh, members of, of our no. of our certain? Not me, because I'm not a doctor. You don't you don't want me doing any kind of work to you. But yeah. for for <laughs> the folks that are peers in in the in the field, what's your message to to caregivers? I'll let defer to you first. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, gosh, it's so important. You know, I want to reference um, something that came up in 2017. There was a nursing textbook um, published by Pearson. Um, that was about, it had a section on cultural competency. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, everything that was listed in that section was um, antithetical to cultural competency. Um, and for black women in particular, uh, or black patients in particular, it talked about how black patients may um, overestimate um, their pain, uh, may, may be, um, you know, um, a little more vocal about pain more than what it actually is. Um, also that uh, black patients are distrustful of healthcare. Um, it, th that caused a, um, quite a firestorm in the community and Pearson retracted that textbook. But it's so important because we're learning, uh, when we think about root causes, um, you start with education mm -hmm. um, of healthcare providers and how, um, again, structural racism, classism is built in, um, even to education. And so we come out of our um, amazing schools of learning um, already with some of these biases baked Absolutely. in. Um, and so it really is a responsibility for the healthcare community um, to, one, to have that awareness, um, that even what we've learned has racism and classism baked in. Um, and to raise that awareness, to check our biases, we learned that pa pain is what the patient says it is. So how could we possibly say that someone's overestimating their pain? 
We are to listen to our patients. We are to listen to black women um, and to respond um, in, a, in the same way that we would with anyone else. So equity is our responsibility. It's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly important. I think one of the things um, that I didn't mention earlier, which is important with black maternal health, um, studies have shown that even though I've referenced classism, that black women um, who are professionals, who have private insurance, um, are no less um, subject to um, racism um, and um, the the ills um, that come along with a poor black maternal So it cross-cuts the economics. So it was, absolutely does. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, as, as well as the negative maternal um, outcome. Absolutely. Okay. You know, sure. um, you know, you know, you can be a, a, a physician yourself, you know, expressing the same concerns and also have a negative outcome, um, be it in a stillbirth or um, or maternal loss. So, you know, I think that um, to say what Dr. Byers is saying is that I think even as practitioners um, that are brown and black, we also need to check our own biases and you know and just really come at and approach patients as humans, right? Sure. And as people individuals, and yeah. individuals and listen to what is being asked of us in this situation and not, you know, feel like, oh, well your pressure is elevated because you feel anxious, you know, white coat syndrome. Does it exist? Yes. But maybe there's a real other root cause that is causing that elevated pressure that should be investigated. Um, so, you know, um, you know, we're all being taught from the same t kind of mainstream, uh, you know, biased you know, isms, you know, sexism, racism. Uh, so, you know, it's using your own filter to say like, hey, that, you know, that doesn't really align with what I know from a medical, clinical perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. So if a patient is saying, you know, they've, you know, they have headaches, you know, don't just assume it's because of stress. You know right. what I mean? Like use your clinical judgment and, and start to evaluate those things. And so um, I would love to say that, you know, um, brown and black, you know, patients can always find a, a practitioner that looks exactly like them. Mm -hmm. But even in finding that practitioner, you know, I think you have to understand that that practitioner may also exhibit some bias based on their own education their training. Yes. and right. training. That's so right. it's important to, that's why I said in the beginning, it's important to be your own advocate and to speak up continuously and to check in with yourself and and use patient advocates um, as, a, as a secondary partner when you know that what you're saying is true and something isn't right, that mm -hmm. something isn't right feeling is a feeling that people should absolutely pursue. And we know, statistically speaking, it's, it's out there in, in, written, in the written word, that these things have life and death consequences, unfortunately, for, for many women. Yeah. Um, so we covered a lot of ground today. I yeah. want to thank you both for yeah. joining me and for talking thank through you. this important topic. Thank absolutely. you. All right, folks. Uh, well, that concludes this community conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you missed any portion of this, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can go to our website, AtlanticHealth.org, or certainly on our YouTube channel, where I encourage you to subscribe, where you'll see all of our community conversations. For Dr. Byers and Dr. Mahdi, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Luke Margolis, and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you.